Hello everyone, welcome to Hurgada. Let's go to Abydos, a four-hour drive through the eastern desert. It's the first pharaonic capital where we'll explore the great temple of Seti I, the center of a powerful religion, the cult of Osiris. We learn about its secret rites. Strange things were happening in Abydos. Some of the stories you hear today will be hard to believe. Recently I showed you Seti's tomb in the Valley of the Kings. It's time for his most beautiful structure. Let's go! was built in the 13th century BC mainly of local limestone with a few parts made of sandstone, like roof slabs. Although from the outside it seems quite modest, it's actually huge. It currently measures 76 meters in length by 110 meters in width. The facade of the temple features 12 pillars and was entirely decorated by Ramesses II, presenting himself proudly standing or making offerings to different gods. Originally, Seti's temple was like seven temples in one, having seven entrances leading straight to each chapel, but already his son Ramesses closed four of them with sandstone blocks to create space for his great dedicatory inscription, in which, in short, he commemorates his father, legitimizes his power, asks the late Seti to intercede with the gods and promises protection over the temple. The temple today is even more special and incomparable because it's the only one with a complete roof preserved. There are no windows, only small slots cut in the roof. Even now, more than 3000 years after its completion, despite the constantly open main door, one can feel the atmosphere of mystery and sacredness which prevailed in all Egyptian temples. Inside, among the forest of columns, we'll see some of the best preserved and most beautiful reliefs in all of Egypt. Let's go inside. We entered the best preserved part of the temple. The first space, over 6.5 meters high, known as the first hypostyle hall, features 24 papyrus columns with closed bat capitals. Although the temple features seven chapels dedicated to different gods, it was a national sanctuary, a pilgrimage center for the worship of Osiris. He was an ancient deity of agricultural origin, fertility and plant growth, originally worshipped at Abydos and Busiris in the Nile Delta. Osiris was initially called Vusir by ancient Egyptians, which translates to powerful or mighty. During the 5th dynasty, he seems to have taken over Anubis' role as god of the dead. Osiris was then recognized as the child of Geb and Nut. His position in the pantheon steadily increased. He ruled over the fertile lands of Egypt, whereas his brother Set ruled over the desert, believed to have been the first ruler on earth after the departure of the gods to heaven. He, as the lord of Egypt, was to bring civilization to people teach agriculture, morality and art. It was he who taught the Egyptians to cultivate the land and his sister Isis showed them how to grind grain into flour. 
He would reign for 28 years and was associated with the fertilization of the Nile, his wife and sister Isis with the rich soil of the Nile, while their siblings Set and Neftis with the desert and barrenness. Osiris was killed by a jealous brother, Set. The most famous version of the myth is that Set gave him the first sarcophagus. When Osiris laid down in it, Set nailed its lid and threw the box into the Nile, where Osiris drowned. Hence the belief among the Egyptians that the drowned reached directly the kingdom of Osiris. Osiris' sister and wife Isis takes and hides the body, but Set finds it and cuts it into 14 pieces. After an epic quest, Isis manages to complete her husband's remains scattered throughout the country. Only his member is lost, swallowed by the Nile fish Medjet. Anubis, according to the myth, the son of Osiris and his second sister Nephthys, the wife of Set, mummifies his father's body, becoming the first embalmer. Isis magically brings Osiris to life, recreates his member so that he can conceive a son with her, Horus the Younger. The Egyptians believed that the ground they walked on lay on the body of Osiris, the lord of life, soil and vegetation, and that the Nile also flows from him. The fall of the Old Kingdom is the diminishment of the solar cult. The position of Osiris grows to during the New Kingdom be associated with Ra himself, his nocturnal form, depicted with the head of a ram traveling in a solar bark through the underworld. Osiris, the master of Maat, represents all that's good and just, becomes a divine judge over the dead. It's before him their hearts are weighed. Finally taking over the role of other gods, Osiris is revered by all Egyptians as a personal protector and savior, the lord of the living, the master of eternity, the king of those who are not. All reliefs in the first hypostyle hall were executed by Seti I, but Ramesses converted them. His sculptors used existing contours, but changed the reliefs and painted them anew. Ramesses decorated his structures mostly in sunk reliefs, whereas Seti is known for his high-quality raised reliefs, which we can admire in the second hypostyle hall we're now in, where Ramesses left them untouched. And the temple is famous for its perfectly preserved reliefs, some of the most beautiful in Egypt, carefully crafted in a conservative style as for post-Amarna art. Seti consistently dissociated himself from Akhenaten's innovations. <laughs> While looking at this wonderful ornamentation, let's learn about the most important ceremony in Abydos, the annual mysterium, the resurrection of Osiris. <laughs> the stele of Ikhernofret from the 12th dynasty. 19th century BC, found in Abydos, describes the annual festival for Osiris at Abydos. Unfortunately, we don't know how long it lasted or which time of the year it was celebrated. Mm. 
The mysterium began with Osiris leaving the temple, then in front of the crowd the murder of Osiris by Set was reenacted. After that began the first procession, going forth of Webwawet, who proceeded to avenge his father. Webwawet, the jackal-headed deity of warfare, was a manifestation of Horus burning with desire for revenge. Embalmed Osiris was carried into the temple, he then became the ruler of the dead, the one who leads the people of the West. The main procession began, the funeral of Osiris, carried from the temple to his grave on the sacred bark Neshmet. Crowds of faithful pilgrims from all over Egypt adored the deceased god. At one stage of the procession, the bark was carried to the consecrated lake of Abydos. It symbolized the mythological voyage of the dead Osiris through the afterlife, the final departure from the world of the living. On the other shore, the mummy from the bark Neshmat was moved to the so-called Vered Bark, the sled on which it was transported to the tomb in Pekar, known today as Umm el kab the desert necropolis of the first kings of Egypt, kind of early dynastic valley of the kings, where Scorpion and Nama were buried, about two kilometers west of the temple of Seti. Only the highest officials and priests could participate in the symbolic funeral at the grave. Resurrection rituals were performed at night. In the secret house of gold near the tomb, a new golden figure of the resurrected Osiris was being prepared. A high-ranking priest delegated by the pharaoh to Abydos for the festivities played the role of his beloved son, the divine Horus, performing, for example, the opening of the mouth ritual. The next part was the Hakar festival, night of the battling Horus. It's a joyful part of the festival when the gods recognize Osiris as the ruler of the underworld and judge of the dead, and his son Horus as the rightful heir. In a cheerful procession, the faithful escorted Neshmet's bark from the necropolis to the temple. The festival ended with pilgrims feasting. We don't know the exact location of Osiris' grave, most likely it was somewhere in the cemetery of the rulers of the first dynasty, where unfortunately I didn't get to. Interesting story by the way, I was stopped by the security staff while trying to film it, but I'll show you this place in one of my next episodes. The second hypostai hall is adjacent to the bark shrines running across the entire width of the temple. Each chapel measures almost 13 square meters, and their vaulted ceilings reach slightly less than six. From left to right, we've got chapels dedicated to Seti I himself, Ta, Rahorachte, Amun Ra, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Osiris was depicted in art as a royal mummy, with the crown of Upper Egypt and two ostrich feathers at each side. He carried the crook and flail. Osiris' body was shown as green, the color of vegetation, or less frequently black, the color of fertile soil. Sometimes he was also portrayed as a lying mummy from which grain sprouts, or simply as trees that were also associated with him. In 
contrast to the New Kingdom temples in Thebes, with one or three chapels intended for the Theban triad, where the one in the middle was always dedicated to Amun Ra, here in Abydos, although Seti designed the middle chapel to house the bark of the Theban chief deity, he located the sanctuary we are now in, the most sacred part of the temple, where Pharaoh unites with the god behind the chapel of Osiris. And it was he, the god of the underworld, not Amun Ra, the one who said he wanted to be united with. Here is one of the most famous reliefs, Seti erecting the jet pillar, the symbol of Osiris, to be more precise, his resurrection. In the Book of the Dead, the jet pillar indicates backbone or spine, hence it was also perceived as a symbol of stability. So important for ancients that there was an annual ritual known as raising the jet. Of course, the true legend of Abydos and this temple was Dorothy Edi, known as Om Seti, a British-born archaeologist and expert of pharaonic Egypt. Born in 1904, at the age of three, she fell down the stairs of her home. The doctor pronounced the girl dead. An hour later, when he came to collect the body, he found Dorothy sitting on the bed playing. Soon after this event, the girl began telling her parents about recurring dreams, about the big pillared building she called her home. She discovered what a place she dreamed about a year later, when she and her parents visited the British Museum. At the sight of the Egyptian exhibition, she reacted very emotionally by kissing the feet of the ancient statues. Not wanting to leave the museum, she told her mother, leave me, these are my people. From then on, she was obsessed with ancient Egypt. She fulfilled her dream of going there in 1933, where she married an Egyptian man she'd met in England. When living in Cairo and working for the Department of Antiquities, she gave birth to a son she named him Seti, and started to be called Om Seti, the mother of Seti. The marriage soon fell apart because Dorothy loved someone else. It was the one who visited her in her dreams, Pharaoh Seti I. Since childhood, she had lived with the memories of the ancient priestess of Abydos, the beautiful Bentreshit. Seti's lover, with whom she was to become pregnant. In order not to blame Seti for defilement of the temple where she resided, Ben Treshit committed suicide. Edie was convinced that she was the reincarnation of the priestess which she openly spoke about. From the memories of her previous incarnation, she even talked about Seti's son, the future Ramesses the Great. Quote, Can't get rid of the idea that Ramesses was a young boy, a young teenager kid, about 14 or 15, other that he's in the reliefs but still a youngster, and very active and energetic, and rather noisy but quite amiable. And about Seti himself, she said, quote, is almost to me rather grave and serious, but very kind and gentle man. She achieved her life goal in 1956 when she finally moved to Avedos. 
She worked first as draftswoman and later as a part-time consultant and a guide. She finally came back home. Dorothy's or Omseti's claims were actually tested at almost every step of her life. Also here in Abydos, when she just started working here, she was taken to this temple and in complete darkness she was told to describe a particular wall painting which actually hadn't been published yet. At everyone's surprise, she did it flawlessly. She knew every detail of the temple and had made many discoveries here as well. She openly worshipped the ancient gods and made regular sacrifices to Osiris. Dorothy Edy made a great contribution to the field of anthropology, studying the customs of the local village people in which she found many ancient pagan traditions cultivated for thousands of years. Widely respected by the locals and Egyptologists, she lived very modestly in her small mud brick house, which she called Om Seti Hilton. She died in 1981. Om Seti prepared an underground Egyptian style tomb for herself, but she was never buried there. We're in the corridor known as the Gallery of the Lists or the Gallery of Ancestors. The list includes cartouches of 76 pharaohs beginning with the King Menes, known as Narma, the first king of United Egypt. The list, however, shouldn't be perceived as an accurate historical source as it excludes many pharaohs. Among them, of course, Hatshepsut and Akhenaten. During the rituals, Seti and his priests were invoking spirits of the predecessors, legitimizing thus Seti's uncontestable position. In the corridor we can also admire a beautiful scene depicting Seti I. He's showing his son Ramesses how to lasso a wild bull. The ground plan of the temple is unique as it has an L-shaped layout. Some say it's because there's an underground water canal and a straight temple could collapse. Others, it's because of the exceptional quantity of bark chapels. The southern extension, besides the Gallery of Ancestors and the Chapel of Sokar and Nefertem, the Memphite counterparts of Osiris and Horus, consists of a few more typical for funerary temples in a chamber, service and storage rooms. Among them, the Hall of Barks, where after the religious parades, the sacred vessels were kept, and the Hall of Butchers, where most likely a symbolic ritual butchery took place. The Osirian, located just right behind the temple. Contemporary Egyptologists claim the structure was planned and raised by Seti I, and although to me it looks much more like the Pyramid Age megalithic structure, they say the Osirian was modelled after the Theban tombs in the King's Valley and the mythical tomb of Osiris. Now heading back through the temple to take a closer look at the open courtyards. Interestingly, in the temple there's an undecorated two-pillared room behind the chapel of Horus, which cannot be entered. The so-called blind room has no doors, windows or any visible entryway. Today its interior can be seen only from above, from the temple roof, naturally possible only with a special permission. What was it for? Were there or are there any underground passages that could lead to it? This is yet another unsolved mystery of Abydos. In 
Initially, the temple measured 170 meters in length, but its two open courts originally entered through pylons are badly damaged. They were finished by Ramesses II. In the first courtyard, we can admire the victory of Ramesses over the Asians. Kabr Egyptian trophy. An ancient custom after a victorious battle was to cut off the right hand of the killed enemy soldiers. This facilitated the counting of the dead and symbolized the ultimate humiliation of the enemy. According to the preserved accounts, soldiers for such trophies were rewarded with gold. It's time to leave this ancient site, as amazing as Abydos itself, one of the oldest cities in Egypt. But don't worry, we'll be back here soon. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you might also like my playlist from Greece, Turkey and Italy. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please do it now. Like my video and leave a comment below. If you would like to support me in my ancient site travel, you can join my Patreon community. I put the link in the description below. See you on another ancient site.